Okay, so we are recording Zapisu uh, Yemo. So I will start my uh, presentation now, my first presentation. If you are not presenting, please turn off your camera. So, so now uh, I hope that you can see uh, learn Ukrainian for uh, Ukrainian students and guests. Tak, bacite. Okay. Okay. Well, um, first of all, you know, thank you too very much for coming, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chris Coy, for making another excellent poster. Um, this is the third conference that we've had in this series of Lucranian. Uh, we call it Lucranian. LU is the name of Lancaster University, where I work, uh, and Ukrainian because we're here to learn Ukrainian language to help people, uh, including and. The, the, the focus uh, this time, I hope, will be on Ukrainian students and also those who have come from the Ukraine as guests to the United Kingdom. So in this short opening presentation, I will explain you know, why it's worth learning Ukrainian and why am I organizing this conference yet again for the third time. Then I'll introduce our speakers today, talk about some practical matters and how this might lead to new things in the future. So uh, a short introduction. Um, I'm British, you know, uh, from the uh, United Kingdom. Um, uh, my first language is uh, uh, is English. I'm a, I'm a, um, I grew up as a monolingual Anglophone. Um, I lecture in chemical engineering here at Lancaster University in the United Kingdom, and I'm also a researcher in biomedical engineering, uh, specifically biomaterials, which are materials which are implanted for, bio, for medical applications to um, you know, support sort of tissue regeneration. And I do this uh, not only in English, but in many different languages. I love languages. And I collaborate um, with uh, people, among others, who speak Russian, who speak Polish, and who speak uh, Czech. And science offers wonderful opportunities to combine so your passions with science and languages, because people in so many countries in the world are doing science. And I, I'm a very keen language butcherer, not just a language learner. Um, I enjoy speaking languages badly, which helps a lot because in order to learn a language well, you have to use it badly and often, like playing a musical instrument. If you want to play well, you must play often and you must play very badly. OK. Now, why are we learning Ukrainian? Well, um, you may know this quote by Nelson Mandela. Sometimes people ask, well, what's the point of learning other languages if everybody speaks English? Sometimes you may hear, well, what's the point of learning Ukrainian if they all understand Russian and many of them understand Polish? Um, what Mandela said was, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. And if you talk to him, but if you talk to him in his language, you know, that goes to his heart. So Nelson Mandela understood the power of language to, you know, connect people. And I feel that if we learned more languages, if we connected with each other better, our world would be slightly uh, happier. And you don't need to learn a language well in order to connect with people. Language is so much more than simply transmitting uh, information. Some people assume, well, it's, a message is the same in whatever language is transmitted. You know, no, it's not. And if, so if you know a language very badly, even, you can still, you know, make a connection with people. Very many people will be pleased that you're learning their language at all. As uh, Kato Lom said, she was one of the first uh, simultaneous translators at the United Nations, and she could simultaneously interpret in um, uh, 10 languages. She said language is the only thing worth knowing even poorly. And that's completely right, because you can connect with people even if you speak their language very poorly. So to explain why it's worth learning Ukrainian, here are two sort of quotes that I received. The first one, Ya absolutna zavoroshoni tim, što Britanci da kladaju da bahatu zusil, šob da pomohte ukrajinskim bijencem i navid roblje taki krok, jak vivčenje ihnoje movoj, 
shall pravilne s nimi spilkovati sa. This man is moved that people are trying to learn Ukrainian, his language. The other quote from um, uh, someone from the United Kingdom, there is only so much you can do with Google Translate. That's also quite right. Google Translate may help you to transmit some information, yes, but what it won't help you to do is it doesn't translate your culture. It doesn't help you to connect with people. Now, and the other real reason for me, at least, to learn Ukrainian is, is because it's so much fun to learn. So for me, I, I find Ukrainian is the fourth Slavic language I've learned. I started learning Russian and then Polish and then Czech. And for me, it's like a delicious cocktail out of Russian and Polish with, as we would say in English, with just a twist of Czech, with a little bit of Czech. And so that's what makes it so fascinating for me. So we had uh, one conference on the 22nd uh, of uh, July, and um, Chris Coy made this a wonderful uh, artwork you know, for the conference. And then we had a second one on the 30th of August. Again, Chris Coy showed some wonderful uh, artistic skills and um, he was very generous in his time for to make this uh, these promotional material for us. And so to explain why we're organizing this um, conference for a third time, I thought I would show you some of the quotes that I received as feedback from the participants. So what did you like about the conference? Ukrainian is a true passion for me, and I was in heaven knowing that we have conferences about that. So the fact that there's a, con a conference about Ukrainian language exists is good news for some people. And the second quote in Ukrainian, call you conferenci berut uchasti, što vivčaja muvi, to nie zvichni dla mene, meni duže spodobalas. This person liked the fact that it was a, a language uh, conference, although it was unusual for him or her. And, and what's the point of these conferences? Well, getting to meet Ukrainians, discussing language, learning with other learners. That's why I was glad to see you know, the discussion that took place before the start of this uh, first presentation about learning Ukrainian. It's, and also it's about connecting with other people who want to learn Ukrainian and teach them and you gain inspiration for them. That's one of the points of conferences in general. And here's some other, some more evidence. Duže vrazila, jak lehko i do zemsi rozmovljati ukrajinsko, ich ni dosvidi bažanja vivčiti ukrajinsko. It was, they, this person was impressed how, you know, we can, how we foreigners can speak Ukrainian and learn about their experiences and their desire, you know, to learn Ukrainian. And, and this person was excited, you know, by the, uh, um, he was impressed by the excitement, you know, for the Ukrainian language in other countries. Okay. And, you know, Get, we talked about getting to know other people with expertise, and there's a, we have, we're trying to have a diversity of speakers and topics and the opportunity to share experience as well. So this is the third conference. So we have three uh, main uh, objectives to show why it's worth learning Ukrainian. I've talked about, about this, but we'll have some speakers who will tell us how Ukrainian helps them to help Ukrainians. Then we'll have some sessions on how to learn Ukrainian, some advice from teachers and learners, and then a more specific focus on students and guests. We'll have speakers who will tell us how we can help Ukrainian students and also a speaker who will comment on the Homes for Ukraine scheme in the UK to help Ukrainian guests. So a quick uh, uh, schedule. Uh, the first talk is being given by myself now. Then we will have uh, Albert Wierczbicki, who gives tours in Ukrainians for uh, Ukrainian refugees in Warszawa, in Poland. Then uh, Tanya Grigorieva will be talking about her work with Respond tri Crisis Translation, translating for Ukrainian refugees. Um, for, with the third speaker, Nina Mishenko, a very good online Ukrainian teacher, unfortunately um, is unable to take part because of the the electricity is not working in Ukraine where she's living because of the blackout which is required. So instead, I will give you a talk instead. After the break, uh, we will have 
people who know how to use English to speak effectively to non-Anglophones. We have Shelley Perchon has a very interesting uh, um, sort of website and business specializing in that. Then we will have one of our students, Peter Merit, who he's really impressive. He learned Ukrainian well enough to have a conversation after six days, and he will share some of his advice with us. And then Emily Richardson, who is an expert in language learning, not just reading, writing, speaking, and listening, but lots and lots of other skills connected with it. Then after the second break, we will have Nochlachla uh, Duba, who will be talking about the Homes for U Ukraine scheme in the United Kingdom. And we will then have uh, Sergei Kachura, who will be talking about the Digital Harbor Foundation and specifically the Ukraine Advancement Fund, which is uh, to help Ukrainians. So some practical matters. Um, we have more than 50 people taking part, most online. Please ask your questions in the chat if you want. When the breaks occur, the meeting will stay open so you can talk to each other online if you want. These talks are all being recorded. If you're not presenting, please turn off your camera and your microphone, please. And then I'll send you a post-conference questionnaire to get some more feedback. And again, the, this whole series of Lucranian conferences is an experiment for my part to try to learn more about you, to learn from you, and to learn how Ukrainian language learning can help people. So thank you very much to two people. Thank you, Derek Hurd. He's the head of Department of Languages and Cultures. He's always been very supportive of this series. Thank you again, Chris Coy, for designing these wonderful uh, promotional materials. And many thanks to you. We can't have a conference without participants. So I hope that this event will be interesting to you. So are there any uh, questions? Okay, well, if not, uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Albert Vyachibitsky to share his screen and give his talk on his uh, tours in Ukrainian. Yeah, 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 but you're the tour of the Ukrainian business. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. So, well, Albert, whenever you're ready, you have uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, I can start. I think I will do this uh, this presentation in English. Uh, the slides, like the, the presentation itself, is going to be in in Ukrainian. Uh, but as I understand, we all here understand English and not Ukrainian, so uh, it might be help helpful for for some people who just start learning, uh, who just started learning Ukrainian. Uh, if you kind of listen to my tips in the language that we all understand. So, uh, first of all, uh, my name is Albert. I'm Polish, uh, living in Warsaw. I work as a tour guide. That's one of my jobs. Um, we met with Timothy actually on a polyglot gathering online, a, a conference for polyglots. And I'm very happy that I can be here with you and share with you some of my uh, experience. Uh, so, uh, as I as my, okay, my main job before COVID, uh, was uh, being a tour guide in Warsaw for foreigners. I did tours mostly in English, and uh, that's how the, in general, uh, the things would go until uh, 24th of February, 24th of February, when I when I uh, kind of started the second initiative. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so this experience allowed me also to take this step uh, into starting. Um, <clears throat> to organize the tours for Ukrainian uh, for Ukrainian refugees in in Warsaw, uh, and the goal of this um, initiative of this project, uh, as I would all sometimes call it, uh, was simply to show um, the city to the people uh, who uh, arrived to Warsaw and they didn't plan it simply, right? Because when the when the uh, war started this February. Um, hundreds of thousands of people or even millions of people um, they uh, came to Poland they were escaping their their homes their their towns um, in order to escape from from the Russian aggression and uh, they arrived to the place that they would never uh, plan to go they would never have an even an idea that Poland can sometimes become their 
uh, even if temporarily, then still home or like, you know, you know the second is like a house, a place where they can find refuge. Um, so uh, I started working in a refugee camp in Warsaw, in one of many, because obviously there were thousands of <clears throat> people arriving every hour, especially in the first uh, first couple of weeks. Um, but then I realized that as, long, as far as I speak Russian, I speak Belarusian as well, which is my, uh, actually I have a degree in, in Belarusian studies in Warsaw, uh, and they also know Ukrainian because the languages are um, very much connected and if you are specialized in the in the region, you always take some uh, experience, take part in conferences where uh, speakers speak uh, those free and also Polish and Lithuanian language. So you have contact with that. And even though I didn't speak Ukrainian before, I decided that, all right, I uh, know the tours. I, I mean, I know how to do them. I can speak Belarusian, which is quite related to, to Ukrainian, very close languages. Uh, <clears throat> so why shouldn't I try to create uh, Ukraine, uh, my own Ukrainian out of the Belarusian and other mix of languages uh, that I have? Uh, so as a result of, uh, of that, uh, I started to I organize the first tour, which was a random tour. I just wrote a post on Facebook um asking my friends and people who would say follow me or who would arrive to uh, to see my my facebook page um that uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m i will organize a free tour for uh, ukrainian refugees is going to be in ukrainian so if you have a desire to join us feel free to be there at one at 1 p.m and uh, i expected that all right maybe because there were friends of mine who uh, who had, uh, who were hosting Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian refugees in the first days. Uh, I, uh, I, I knew that some of them will, will join, right? But then I was very surprised that I had almost more than 40 people on the first tour, like out of the blue, uh, when uh, the, the information about it was shared just, uh, just uh, less than 24 hours before. So I was very happy and it also gave me this kind of push to go through, even though my language wasn't perfect. People were very happy that I uh, <clears throat> that I um, can use the language they they know uh, and the, their native language or the language of, of their heart, as um, Timothy Timothy mentioned before. Um, that somebody wants to take care of them, not only in the terms of uh, finding a place where they can sleep, giving them some, I don't know, uh, hygienical materials, whatever, in the refugee camp or something, but also to show them the place that they unfortunately needed to um, to, to 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 get, yeah, to after uh, after the war started. So, <clears throat> so who are mostly the participants? I mentioned already, so uh, that th th those were mostly refugees um, who arrived to war. So one, two, three, five days before the tour um, started. Uh, mostly those were mothers with children. Uh, and what is important, they were both Ukrainian uh, speaking and the Russian speaking. Uh, anyway, uh, as I'm going to tell later on, I stick to, to Ukrainian all the time um, for one other uh, purpose. And then sometimes we had Ukrainians that already lived in Poland and they uh, were here and they kind of heard about somehow about those tours and they also decided to join. And sometimes we had also the hosts, which was very, very nice because even though the hosts very often mm, didn't speak Ukrainian or even a word of any other Slavic language than Polish, they would be with the families, with those with those mothers and children and uh, going with, with me through the entire um, uh, tour. So that's something that was also very touching. Um, the challenges. There was obviously the language barrier that we had. As I told you, I spoke uh, Russian, Belarusian, Polish before, and Ukrainian was mostly passive. So uh, I had this barrier that sometimes I was, I was looking for words in my Polish, Russian or Belarusian, and I was simply uh, Ukrainizing them. Uh, but it, and it worked pretty well. So sometimes people would understand, sometimes people would, would ask me again, uh, what this word was, and I was looking for the other language, uh, simply based, and uh, or they will tell me the the correct uh, form, right? If it was, for example, Russian, and they knew this this word, so um, it was pretty. Uh, there was a pretty nice cooperation between me and my tourists uh, on this language level, and I could share with them my uh, personal, like professional um, skills, uh, guiding them through or so. Then uh, the challenge was also to speak as little as possible about war. 
uh, I mean war in general, because uh, unfortunately Warsaw is not the, the best place to uh, find the refuge out when there is a war in your country, because when you're going to learn about history of, of Warsaw, especially in the last eight years, it's going to be all touched by war, because Warsaw was destroyed in 85%. During Second World War, it was a city of one and a half million people. Uh, so there is no option to speak about the history of this of the place without mentioning war. So obviously the Second World War, obviously. So I uh, I needed to kind of facilitate my my speech, my tour to obviously mention those hard facts, but at the same time make people not thinking about the tragedy that is happening in, in their country. Uh, and then obviously we had the people with different experience. As I told you, there were many people who didn't expect to go to Poland at all. Uh, so we had people from obviously from the from Kiev, from capital city, from big cities, but we had also uh, people from villages, right? People who um, from different social classes. So obviously making this tour available for their cultural and uh, also he knowledge of history um, so that everybody enjoys the tour, so it's not too intellectual and at the same time it's not um, too basic. It was also quite quite a challenge, but uh, in the end it was all, all fine. Um, then what were the results? Uh, so I obviously learned Ukrainian to the level that I would never even plan before. Uh, so uh, today I can say I speak Ukrainian pretty well uh, and I'm very... Um, I'm especially very, not very proud, but uh, very confident about my Ukrainian, which also doesn't help very often because uh, uh, I already have patterns that might not be really Ukrainian, but af as after making like 20 tours about some topic and to, uh, to repeating uh, the same sentence for 20 times, uh, for me it became Ukrainian, while then I can have a tour right now, private tour, and people to, uh, ask me, well, what does it mean? Uh, so that's that's a thing. Um, then there is collective uh, result that, um, that the refugees, especially in the first weeks and days and when we didn't know how long the conflict would last and how what will be the outcome of that. Uh, so I, um, the, the refugees, they felt that they are kind of the, the, the place eventual place where they would uh, stay is being prepared for them and it's welcoming them so they they, they arrive, arrive here and they know something about it and then uh, the general uh, result was also that we have the <clears throat> uh, context like we understand context better between polish polish people understand the ukrainian context much better and, and the ukrainian understand the polish co context much better um that's for the let's say general the like uh, situation of our of our two nations two countries um thanks to such tours uh, the first thing i already mentioned that that the first out uh, uh, the first perspective the first I think we, we show by doing such tours is that we show to the people that their language, which in this case is Ukrainian, um, is important and you can speak about it, you can talk about it abroad outside Ukraine and about the things that are not connected to Ukraine at all. Um, being a Belarusian uh, studies, uh, like having degree in Belarusian studies, um, having masters in that, uh, I know how important it is for people to show that their language is not marginal. It's it's important, and you can uh, do things in that, especially when when you're facing the danger of of the Russian world um, that tries to show to the smaller languages like Ukrainian, Belarusian. Um, that uh, those languages are just languages of a village or a language that you simply cannot speak about uh, high things or like big things that are not connected to the like a daily life of a Ukrainian. Um, then uh, the second thing is that uh, abroad you can find a person, uh, a local person who can speak Ukrainian and people very often were very shocked when they realized that they uh, and not Ukrainian, and they have no Ukrainian roots, and they speak it, and they and they do those tours. So it's also very important for those of you who learn, who start learning Ukrainian. The third thing is that uh, you have uh, the perspective for the obviously development of tourism in both countries. Polish people can go to Ukraine, Ukrainians to Poland much more often. And then the fourth thing, especially for the children who needed to join the Polish educational system for one two semesters or a year or two it's also easier for them to understand the general context of what their 
uh, peers might speak in in school, right? Uh, having this more uh, wide uh, hist historical and cultural context. And that's all. I think I made it in 10, 10 minutes, more or less. Uh, if you want to contact me, uh, you you can find my name here. You also find it on the schedule of the uh, of this of this uh, conference. So you can ask um, add me on Facebook, write to me, or you can write me an email. Uh, or you can also find me on on Instagram. And obviously, the company that I do the tours normally for is uh, called Orange Umbrella Free Tour. So whenever you are in Warsaw, feel free to join the tours. Uh, we can do the tour in Ukrainian, in in English, in Italian, in Belarusian, or in Polish, obviously. Uh, so I don't know if you have time for questions right now. If uh, not, then thank you so much. Uh, and, yes. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Albert, for starting our conference off very well. Um, does anyone have a question, you know, here in Lancaster or in the chat? Well, in that case, I'll, I have two quick comments and one com and one question for Albert. Um, uh, you talked about how Ukrainians are generally shocked when they find you speak Ukrainian, but you don't have a family connection to the country. Is that right? Um, I put a name in the chat of a man who was very good at doing that in Mo Moses McCormick, and his name was his nickname was Lao Shu fifty five thousand. He was a, a, a black American who loved to speak to immigrants, and he could could speak to them in new Chinese, Russian, um, new German, Spanish, French. He could speak actually fifty languages, and that he actually in, in, the if you looked at some of his videos, the um, uh, sort of the shock that he inspired that he causes in people the 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 pleasant shock is well worth looking at and it's, it's one of the nicest things about sort of language learning i have a quick question if i may albert about um you uh, <coughs> giving tours to ukrainians in general in my limited experience of doing tours i've noticed that people from different countries often tend to have different expectations so i I have the impression that British people, for instance, often want to be entertained when they're uh, doing a tour, whereas people from some other countries want to receive a lot of information. Uh, I know I'm generalizing, but if someone was to um, create a tour for sort of Ukrainian um, uh, for Ukrainians, what would your advice to them be? I mean, you already mentioned a lot of ways in which you adapted your tour to Ukrainians, but could you tell us a bit more about the general, you know, expectations of Ukrainians um, when 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 they go on tours? Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say that it's like a much of a national uh, differences, but uh, more of a back, background of a, uh, of a person. Because if you do those tours for, like as I did for the for the um, refugees, uh, it's not so sure that they would be interested in uh, taking part in a tour in uh, let's say normal situation right so they might be less interested in general in joining the tour then uh, if people go somewhere abroad if we go for holidays and we did i don't know, go to italy and we want to take a tour in rome or in bologna or somewhere else we are already we have this already like this uh, basic interest for that right and then we can maybe a little bit talk about the expectations of like national expectations but if people don't want to go for a tour in general uh, or they might not be so um, open for that in, in, let's say, normal situation, right? Not being a refugee, but a tourist. Um, then I would say that uh, for the most, you need to uh, you need to simplify things. That's the thing. That's the first thing, right? Because you cannot teach them uh, history of your country in uh, two hours. Uh, at the same time, showing them some certain places, talking about certain people, and uh, making some fun facts. So obviously, I would say that uh, it's important to uh, definitely make some funny stories, interaction, especially for those people. It's very important to uh, make them feel comfortable on this tour because they are lost. Uh, I mean, especially in the first weeks right now, maybe not anymore, but in the first weeks um, when they were just arriving to, to Poland, they were lost because they didn't know where to go, what to do. So we definitely need to show them, first of all, the understanding of a situation and you need to be open 
and kind of warm towards them. And as I told you, not talking about war so much. I don't know how much war affected your cities and countries. Uh, so maybe it's going to be much easier than in Poland if you, I don't know, if you are not in I don't know, Dresden in Germany, right? Um, then it's going to be much easier to not talk about war. Um, and uh, yeah, making it funny and entertaining so that they can have some happy feelings and warm feelings about your place. Well, thank you very much. Is there another question for uh, Albert? OK, well, if not, um, Tanya uh, Grigorieva was now scheduled to speak. Uh, unfortunately, she is due to the situation in Ukraine. She is fi it's finding it difficult to connect. So my suggestion is that um, because the speaker after her, Nina Mishchenko, is unable to attend, I will give you a talk uh, as well. Instead, while um, we are waiting for uh, uh, Tanya to connect. Now, we have doctors in the house today, doctors in the audience. So I will uh, give you a medically related talk. OK. So I will just just give me a moment, please. So if you're not one request, if you're not um, uh, presenting, please turn off your mic, your your camera. OK, so I hope you can now see Travlenia uh, Ukrainsku more view digestion in Ukrainian about learning anatomy via Ukrainian and learning Ukrainian via anatomy. OK, because. I'm not an anatomist, I'm not a doctor, but if you look at anatomical terms in Ukrainian, they often more make more sense. And so anatomy is easier to digest, as we say in English, when you do it in Ukrainian. And so I'm going to give you the example of a digestive system and showing you how by learning Ukrainian, you can learn anatom an anat an anatomy better and the function or, and the, or the, um, uh, the uh, appearance of different sort of uh, anatomical features in the digestive si system. And then also how by learning Ukraine anatomy, you can also learn some Ukrainian. So integrating the, the learning of the two things. So as in, in English, we would say kill two birds with one stone or in Ukrainian, uh, and how this actually helps. Well, uh, one of the things that I do is I translate medical documents for Ukrainian refugees. And by learning about these terms, you can do your translations more effectively. OK, so um, I hope that you are not disappointed that I don't show you any photos today um, of the digestive tract or, as they say in uh, the uh, stomach intestinal tract or the gastrointestinal tract, as we, we would say in English. But we can we will start go from start to finish and I will show you why the terms in Ukrainian make more sense than the terms in English. Now, a lot of terms in English for anatomy are of Greek origin or, or, or of Latin origin, but in Ukrainian, the meaning is actually often closer to the Ukrainian uh, words. So if we start with the uh, esophagus, where the food goes into the mouth and then down into the stomach, esophagus is a word of Greek origin, and the Ukrainian word for that is stravohid. And that's a combination of two words, strava, in the sense of food, as in being a dish, dish or a fare, and hid, move or hear a passage. So it's actually where the food passes through, which makes more sense. OK, and then moving on to the next part. St stomach in the uh, stomach in English. Well, um, in uh, French, this would be l'estomac. And the word uh, actually has a, um, a Latin sort of, you know, origin. But there are two words for this. Uh, in um, uh, in 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 uh, Ukrainian, the first is jeludok, which comes from the word jolud, which is an acorn, which in a way describes the form of the stomach, and the other word is shlunok, which actually is a Germanic word for um, the innards or the nutroshi. Okay. Now it starts to make even more sense in English, in Ukrainian, and even less sense in English. 
So we'll move after the stomach, we move to the small intestine or the tonka kishka, the thin intestine in Ukrainian. And after the stomach, the uh, food passes to the duodenum. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right in English, but it's a Latin word. And it means actually the space of 12 digits because it's about uh, uh, the length of uh, 12 sort of digits, 12 fingers. But in, in Ukrainian, it makes more sense. People say, Dvanatsity is a pala kishka. And that, the Dvanatsity pala, the first part comes from the number Dvanats, 12. And the second part comes from palets, which is the finger. So you actually have the 12 finger intestine, and the meaning is much more clear in Ukrainian. So then after Duodenum, we have the, I don't know if it's the Yeunum or the Jejunum. I never learned anatomy in English, but it's a Latin word that comes from fasting. Now in Ukrainian, the word is porozhnaya kishka, which means literally the empty intestine. And because when pathologists would open uh, corpses, dead bodies, and the this um, uh, part of the small intestine would be empty, if I'm not mistaken, because it has a higher motility. So even after you die, it keeps working and the food is pushed out of it, so it's empty, okay? Porozhnaya is the word for empty in Ukrainian, and kishka is the intestine, so it's the empty intestine. And then the next part, the ilium, that comes as a Greek word, meaning to twist up. But in Ukrainian, they say klubova kishka. Now, klub is actually another word for the thigh, or another word for the thigh is stigno. And because it's actually situated sort of near actually to the uh, the thigh, so then the, hence the name, and then kishka being intestine. Again, the meaning is clearer in in, in um, uh, Ukrainian. Then we move on to the large intestine, or as the Ukrainians say, the tovsta kishka, the thick intestine. And actually, that makes more sense as well, because if I'm not mistaken, the you, the uh, small intestine is actually longer than the large intestine. So I'm not sure actually which takes up more volume, the small or the large intestine, but actually it's more uh, less confusing to call it the thin and the thick intestine like in Ukrainian. So this part of the Ukraine, this part, the first part of the uh, large intestine is a dead end. It's called the cacum, which comes from the Latin word for blind. But in Ukraine, it's the sleeper kishka, sleepy, meaning blind and kishka intestine. So a more immediate meaning. Then we have the appendix, um, sometimes referred to as the vermiform of the cacal appendix, the appendix of the cacum. Um, and the appendix actually comes from appendo, the Latin word for I hang or I suspend. You could say it's being suspended from the cacum. Now in Ukrainian, you can say appendix as well, but their word for it is the Cervo podibni vidrostek. And the cervo part comes from cerviak, which is a worm. And the podibni comes from the word similar. And the vidrostok is a word that means outgrowth. Okay, so it's basically the worm like outgrowth. Now, if you look at the English term vermiform uh, appendix, vermi, if I'm not mistaken, does come from a Latin word for uh, worms as well. So, but in, in Ukrainian, again, the meaning is much more direct. Then the next part, the colon. Now, the colon is actually comes is actually a Greek word, uh, and it's been uh, taken into English. In Ukrainian, they call it obodova kishka. Kishka, the intestine. If I'm not mistaken, the two parts that I've ringed here, the um, the ascending and the descending colon, are actually attached to the rim of the peritoneum, the rim of the ab abdominal, the edge of the abdominal cavity. If I'm not mistaken, the uh, transverse colon, the sigmoid colon, are actually um, are, 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 are not fixed. But again, the meaning of it is clearer, and actually the, how, uh, and how it relates to other anatomical structures is clearer in, in Ukrainian. Now, almost at the end, the rectum comes from Latin, meaning straight. But it's even more obvious in Ukrainian, the straight intestine. And at the very end, 
The anus comes from a Latin word for ring, but in Ukrainian, it's the vihidnik. Vihid means more or less departure, and the 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 nik is like one, so like the one that departs. The vihidnik, again, more obvious than anus. So, very briefly, we can kill two birds with one stone by learning subjects, you know, together, such as anatomy and um, Ukrainian. Science is vice versa if you know how to combine the two. Now, thank you very much for your attention. I'm not an anatomist and my Ukrainian is far from perfect. So please correct me if my anatomy was incorrect or if my uh, um, uh, Ukrainian was incorrect. The main, the, the main message I'm trying to give you is if you combine your learning of two subjects together, you can learn both of them more effectively. OK. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. OK, Darren. maybe two no, sorry, more. Sorry, 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 sorry. Just, 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 just a moment. Sorry, there was a question here in, in Lancaster. Right, yes. So um, um, the question is, you know, Albert was able to you know, improve his Ukrainian, learn Ukrainian by his work as a tour guide and conversing with people. How do I improve my knowledge of Ukrainian uh, anatomy related terms? Well, actually, I started doing this. Uh, um, what I just showed you was self-talk. I don't converse with people about the digestive system in Ukrainian very often, but I do uh, help with some medical um, translations for um, respond to crisis translation. I see Tatiana Grigorieva is here and you, she, will, she will talk about you know, her um, respond to crisis translation organization, which does this. So it did, there is a, a link to my um, to my to my sort of, some voluntary work that I do that uh, sort of made me sort of interested in the anatomical terms and by learning about these terms I've been able to sort of do translations of more effectively so although I'm not conversing with people it is linked to something more than just a uh, an academic interest now there was a question from um, Volodymyr uh, it's not question it's uh, maybe two word because uh, not kishka, but uh, kishka. Kishka, it means cat. Uh, there ah, are different okay. uh, word stress and uh, letters uh, E with dot and uh, E like uh, uh, English U, it's uh, different words. In uh, Ukrainian, yes. we uh, usually use E, e like Russian E. So, yeah. uh, kishka, it's Ukrainian cat. And the uh, kushka, this means intestine. All right, so should the, 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 the stress is on mm -hmm. the second syllable, kushka. Kushka. Kushka, okay, yes. Kushka. Kushka. And uh, yeah. the stress is the last uh, word, oh, right. last letter. And oh, right. kishka, uh, stress is yeah. uh, the first E, and yes. it's uh, E, not E. Oh, yes. Yes, one one thing difficult. Yeah, one thing in in, uh, in Russian, Polish, and Ukrainian. Yeah, yeah. two two what two two two. There's uh, uy and e, and these are two different vowels. Yes. Yes, oh, usually it's... there are lots of uh, words that may be the same, the same meaning, the same word, but in uh, Russian it's e, and uh, in Ukrainian it's u. Okay. Some, right. Some. Right. So we have one one more question from James Douglas. <laughs> Uh, you, you're muted. Yes, of course. How do you respond to the fact that, in fact, that those languages you mentioned, Greek and Latin, were, of course, would have been part of a common language hundreds of years ago. And I'm sure many Ukrainians uh, who were studying in all sorts of subjects would have used both Greek and Latin and but thus have been able to communicate with all other 
Western European speakers without any trouble because they were all spoken Latin or Greek to each other. Right. Well, um, again, maybe somebody from Ukraine with medical tra training would be better equipped to to answer this than I would. I mean, um, I, to be honest, I don't know. I have no idea how well people sort of spoke Latin to them, you know, in the scientific community uh, many years ago when lit Latin was often used as a, a, a lingua franca. Um, uh, again, but is the the. The, 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 one of the problems is that a uni I mean, a universal language, which is Latin, has actually been lost, which is well, one of the main reasons why it's so difficult to communicate with other people. Although well, I know that's at the that's at the that is at the intellectual level, not at the common level. I understand that. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I would. I would again. I dispute the. Uh, uh, the um, uh, I don't. I, I don't like the use of the word universal language, either for Latin or now for English today, because. That is not. It is not. Uh, shall we say, um, uh, a language is not universally uh, ac accessible to everybody, sort of, you know, in the world. So you you might say it's a commonly used language. But then I think I think I think there's a lot of danger in using the word universal uh, language. I mean, I take your point that if people, a lot of people, know a certain language, then they may know in 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 a lingua franca. They they if they know a, a certain term. If you say a term in a lingua franca, then you will then you will know the term. Uh, another person speaking another language may recognise that same term in the lingua franca. Okay, um, right. Oh, it's uh, Carmen. Uh, one quick question. Uh, it's not actually a question. I just want to comment from a non medic and a Chinese perspective, because for our Chinese translation, we translate the meaning as you mentioned the twelve digit. So we, we, as a layman, we already know it very well what it means in Chinese. But when I learned the English term, it makes no meaning to me because I don't know Latin at all. That's why I feel like it's good that a language has translated the Latin meaning into what it tried to convey in, in Latin. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. In, indeed, I, I would again. This this could be a much wider discussion than than you know Ukrainian. Um, I do also, uh, in some other languages that I've learned, such as you know, German, uh, you have a much closer um, relationship between the, shall we say, the everyday language and certain anatomical terms used by, well, um, than, than, than in English, for instance. But um, unfortunately, we have to, uh, well, not unfortunately, because we have a good, con uh, we have a good uh, uh, talk coming up now by uh, Tatiana uh, Grigovieva, who is representing Respond Crisis Translation. So, Tatiana, whenever you're ready, please share your screen and we can start. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, super. I will just, if you don't mind, I will just go through the same slides. Just a second, how do I... Um... Uh, can you see my screen right now? Not yet. Hello? Um, hmm. Okay, 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 I got it. Okay. Uh, is it on? No? Can you can you see my screen? I apologize. Yes, I yes, so, yes. We, what we can we can now see medical translations became already okay. now respond crisis translation. <laughs> yeah, because you mentioned it. Okay, uh, thank you, team, for letting me talk in this conference on behind the respond crisis translation again. And uh, I apologize for being late. We, I'm in Kiev, and we had unscheduled power outage, so I had to come back to come to um, to the way I could find the power in the internet, and I'm sharing the room with other people. So I, I want to speak briefly as I it's already I spoke about respond before. Uh, 
Um, so Respond Crisis Translation is a collectible language activist um, that are, do basically volunteer translation for more than 108 languages. And uh, um, I'm here to, pre to represent Ukrainian Russian languages team and uh, to talk briefly about what we do uh, for Ukrainians, Ukrainian refugees and for um, uh, organizations and people who work with Ukrainians and Ukraine and who support Ukraine. And uh, I would like to invite you to collaborate with our e effort and join us. Um, so mostly uh, 95 percent of our team we work with uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, as, uh, as we know there are about 15 million Ukrainians that had to flee since the beginning of the war and all of them have to register the new place uh, go to the hospital go to the school and uh, basically to start the new life at the new spot, at least temporarily life, it, they all uh, had to overcome the language barrier. Um, so Respond Crisis Translation is an organization of volunteers, as I mentioned, um, that we help them uh, to do that. Um, in our team, we have uh, 100, 50 volunteers translating from Ukrainian language and uh, 450 volunteers translating from Russian language. As we know that there are some Soviet documents in Ukraine that are still in Russian. Uh, what kind of uh, translations do we do? It's, um, first of all, all kinds of documents, passport, IDs, birth, marriage certificates, educational documents, medical documents. Uh, we also have an increased number of asylum applications from countries like Russia and Belarus, but that's more on uh, Russian language um, teams. Also, we help to translate uh, temporary protected service applications for the US, and um, we interpret interviews with uh, or, um, organizations that provide like uh, justice support and um, uh, psychological support for uh, Ukrainian refugees. So as Tim mentioned, our biggest priority, I, I'm sorry I was late, but I've heard Tim talking about it, is a medical translations. We have increasing number of terminally ill patients that had to flee in Ukraine and end up in different countries in the world that uh, had to are uh, present urgently their medical history and uh, some to to other medical institutions in Europe and um, US and Canada and it's uh, mostly like medical translation medical text sometimes it's like scribbles uh, like doctor scribbles it's impossible to read and um, uh, with a lot of uh, medical jargon, a lot of terminology, and it's not only Ukrainian English. Um, it's uh, Ukrainian to French, German, Spanish. Um, I had to mention that uh, we have about nine language combination right now, translating from Ukrainian. Um, it's a Ukrainian, Ukrainian and Russian, German, French, Czech, Polish, Swedish. Um, oh, okay, here is a slide. And the uh, Czech. Um, so um, the medical translation is like the biggest, medical and legal translation are our biggest priorities priority right now it's like the most um, difficult translations and the less um, experienced translators we have so i would like to invite like anybody who knows medical doctors just translators who are proficient in medical medical terms and medical and, or just native speakers who understand medical terms Native speaker, I mean, of 
English and any language because we do a lot of language combinations. So a native speaker can uh, proofread the translation. So we're looking for proofreaders and it's uh, one of our priorities right now. Um, I wanted to say a few words uh, of, about our work with um, different organizations. Um, so most of our organization or organizations are in the United States and in uh, London, and most of them are law organization or volunteers organization, organizations that support Ukrainian refugees. And uh, it's like to register, find homes, and uh, we have an increasing number of psychological supports where um, we um, mostly it's interpretation and we could provide in-person interpretation so we have volunteer translators in like all over the world so they can come and interpret in person yeah. and we could do it over phone zoom or any uh, any any mean uh, via the internet um so here we're also looking for interpret interpreters experienced in legal terms right i think we might have lost uh, tanya okay but i while we're waiting for her to come back um i would say um if any of to those who are learning Ukrainian, I found. Uh, you know, oh, for, oh, are you back now? Hello, I, I'm back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. I, I I just realized I dropped. No, no, I dropped no, out. No, 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 please, please finish. Uh huh. Okay. So um, I I would I would like to talk briefly about our team, and um, as I mentioned, we have. It's a volunteers. It's volunteers who would like to uh, work with Ukrainians and Ukraine. And um, our volunteers are not only translators and interpreters, but um, our volunteers have other skills like to do social media, public relationship support. But of course, mostly it's translators and interpreters. This is what we do. Our, in our Ukrainian Russian language team, we have a team lead who is me and which is me. And um, we have three project managers right now. We lost one project manager and um, we have one proofreader. Um, our interpreters uh, are skilled. We have interpreters and translators who are skilled in different um, fields. So we have professional court interpreter, for example, who can advise um, on some legal terms and help other translators to translate, train new translators. Uh, we have interpreters, uh, translators skilled on uh, subtitling and um, uh, doing like voice over translations uh, that we can also train uh, new translations, uh, translators and interpreters on, um, on that. Uh, we've been involved recently uh, with organizations working on um, war crime videos in Ukraine, doing exactly um, subtitles, uh, subtitles uh, uh, and voice over translations for their videos on YouTube. Um, and we have our medical translators. We have them, but uh, most of our translators are volunteers, so they have their day job and they do this work in their time, in their free time. So we are desperately in uh, in need for more medical translators, more medical interpreters, more um, um, legal translators. And I think I dropped out. Uh, I lost the call when I was trying to say that our translators are um, trained as it's, it's so-called like trauma um, trauma aware so because they translate for refugees and for people in crisis who went through a lot of uh, 
personal challenges like fleeing the war when they well they some of their family been killed and their houses destroyed with this like process to run and of course it's a heavy burden on interpreters themselves psychologically so we do <clears throat> special training for our in translators and interpreters on that and we support them they have psychological support we have psychological um Say we have a psychologist who can um, speak with our interpreters when they have to, through, to go through vicarious trauma. Um, why I'm saying that, uh, I mean, the main goal of my presentation is, of course, to invite all of you to collaborate and um, spread the word to organizations and uh, people you know, inviting them to work with us. And uh, uh, why I asked Tim um, to speak about this conference, though, like I presented Respond work before, um, because we were expected by this time to register Ukrainian uh, non-profit organization, like Ukrainian organization on the Respond and I literally spent like this entire week in the Minister of Justice trying to, to do this, but um, because of the constant um, um, air alerts and power out outages schedule and schedule, it became like just complicated because uh, of their just power and internet. So unfortunately, I cannot say that that we are we were reborn as Ukrainian and Joe, but we're in process of registration, and I hope to come with a good news soon. Um, and um, why I wanted to mention this that uh, and my slide is our financial priorities and goals that respond crisis translation started paying Ukrainian translators in Ukraine and re Ukrainian refugee translators. Um, uh, just just pay, paying them, uh, but we don't have our own funding. So right now we get this funding to pay them from our other languages group um, and from uh, donations, just people's donations. So we're trying to register Ukrainian non-profit organization, non-government organization, so we can, um, it, it, it will be a public association, so we can uh, uh, participate in the uh, uh, we can apply for international and uh, national grants to support our work. And also I'm asking for your input, for your advice, and uh, just to establish connect connections. If you know any networks, any opportunities uh, where we could apply, where we could fit, where we could collaborate, please let me know. I would be really interested to do that. And um, we are trying to establish as many connections as we can with Ukrainian organizations in Ukraine, as it will also support our like goal to like participate in international donors grants. So we can help, we can support more Ukrainian refugees and more U activities in Ukraine. Not even we are not supporting only refugees, also um, such uh, big projects in Ukraine, like reconstruction of Ukraine. There are a lot of agencies or donors are trying to come to help, to assist, to rebuild Ukraine, to rebuild ruined houses, ruined infrastructure. And we understand that all needs, uh, they all need um, language support. Uh, and as I mentioned, like there are a lot of uh, justice organization working on uh, war crimes. Uh, where we also would like, we already work on it, but we want to have more coverage and develop more in this. So the need is big. And um, if you know any organizations that we could connect with to build our team more, um, I would be really happy to connect. So basically the goal of my presentation today is just to um, link with more people, with more people experienced uh, or interested in Ukraine, Ukrainian language, or in, working with international organizations, with refugee organizations, or just individuals who want to help, help um, just to build up our team, create more links uh, with organizations and person, and uh, provide more support to Ukraine. And- um, okay. I think uh, we're, 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 we're about 15 minutes behind schedule now. Okay.
Okay. So, uh, yeah, would, you, would, you, would, would you mind sort of showing your last slide? Sure. Thank you very much, Tim. So, and my last and one more most important slide is here is a link uh, that if any of you or your friends would like to come and join our organization, you are welcome. Please do it. And uh, this is a link to register. Um, you can re uh, join, not necessarily as translator, but if you want to come in any role uh, to support, to link with organizations or anything. And I will provide in the conference chat um, like the brief text that you can share and my personal contact my WhatsApp and my email, my respond email. Uh, so uh, my LinkedIn and uh, just please connect uh, with me and please reach out to me. Please share this information with uh, your friends, uh, colleagues, people who you know. Um, we would like to invite you to help us build our team and grow. And team, thank you very much again to let me speak for the third time at your conference for instance. It's a really big honor and I really appreciate it. Thank and, you very much, Tatiana. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any, one very quick question and one uh, quick answer, please? Sure. Anyone uh, have a question? Okay, well, in that case, um, uh, I'll just say a very, wor very worthwhile um, you know, thing to contribute to and a very good way of improving your sort of language skills and helping people at the same time. Thank you very much, Titiana. Now, I am I'm appreciate that we are behind schedule. Now, uh, may I suggest that we have a, a break now for just three minutes, and then we will start again at um, at, uh, at, uh, at 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 ten past of six. Okay, um, with uh, with uh, Shelley um, um, Shelley's talk on 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 unlockings of uh, English. So I will leave the chat open just for three minutes if anyone wants to uh, to, to use it. I'll, I'll stop the recording, but I will restart when we start the second session, okay?